Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to put your hands down. Now today, we are going to be setting up the Raspberry Pi and exploring the Raspberry Pi desktop. Um, that's probably where we're going to end up today, finish up today. So right now, you guys do not have to worry about having your Raspberry Pi set up, but I do want you to try to find those components right now. So make sure you, you, can, you have your Raspberry Pi, the cords that you'll need, and we're going to go through those in just a moment, the mouse and the keyboard, headphones if you want headphones, the monitor, and then you'll need these cords. You're going to need a power cord, that micro HD cord. I'm sorry, not the micro HD, the micro USB cable. You're going to need an HDMI cord as well. And that's to connect to your monitor. All right, so these are the things you're going to need. Now, many of you had questions saying that you didn't have a cord or that um, you didn't have a monitor. And I did take down those people's names and sent them to Mr. Dubik. Um, and we talked, and what he told me, uh, he can try, he can help, give resources, give tips on where to find these. Goodwill is a good place to find a keyboard and a mouse for the USB connection or to find a monitor. However, Young Engineers of Today does not provide the monitor or the keyboard or the mouse. We do provide the pies, but not those aspects. So, again, I did pass those names along for those of you who were concerned. Uh, hopefully he has contacted you or reached out to you. If not, he should be reaching out very, very soon. And today, you can just follow along and know that you'll have the recorded version of tonight's lesson uh, moving forward that you can look at. Raise your hand if you can hear me. OK. Oh man, I hope more of you can hear me than just three people. Please raise your hand if you can hear me. There we go. Okay. Um, Brianna joined my phone. Great. Alexis. Yes, let me just copy that down. Alexis, he's not going to be able to get you a monitor, but hopefully he can he can talk you through and and maybe give you some advice on on where you can get a monitor. So right now we're waiting as people kind of gather their stuff and, and join us. Okay. Yes, Kate, you're going to need your keyboard and monitor right now. And if you don't have access to a keyboard and monitor, don't worry. Please do work on trying to get that ready for Monday. But today you can follow along with the webinar, and this is being recorded, and you can then follow along with the recording at a later date. Alexis, do you have your hand up for a question? Okay, someone's already connected and ready to go. We're going to connect these. That's We're going to spend the first little bit of class doing that, Brianna, so I'm, I'm glad that you know how to do it. That's awesome. Rachel, no worries. Okay, good. Alexis put her head down. Okay, before we get started, I have a few questions for you, a little bit of a pop quiz, if you will, uh, about the history of computing. 
So someone um, can tell me if this statement is true or false. As, as the history of computing has evolved, um, so as computers uh, um, were getting more and more modern and are getting more and more modern, or I should say are improving, and as time moves on, our computers this I realize this question has transformed. It is no longer a true false question. Are computers becoming more user friendly or are computers becoming less user friendly? You can raise your hand or you can type in a response. I'm seeing a lot of more user friendlies in the typing. Excellent. I would love to hear a voice for the next question if I have a brave soul, but that is correct. More user friendly. That was a pretty, uh, I'm going to say that was a little softball for your beginning question, but good. As computers advanced, they became more user friendly, which meant you had to have less expertise to use them. Now, can someone give me an example? Uh oh, the slide might be giving it away. An example of something that is a very user-friendly device. A computer that's, that's exemplary uh, of this user-friendly technology. I see iPad, iPhone, iPod. <laughs> yes, I see a whole slew of, of Apple products. And I want to be clear here. Really, it's any kind of tablet device, especially touchscreen tablets devices. And even before we got to the, iPod, um, the iPad, computers were uh, becoming a lot easier to use. Uh, you know, we were having, you know, we, the invention of the GUI or the graphical user interface, you know, that addition of the desktop, the addition of the mouse, these things are all steps to becoming more user friendly. But iPad, absolutely because it's designed so easy that a baby can use it. Um, so what's the, what's the harm here? What's the harm in user-friendly? Now this question's hard. Oh, can we see the cat? This is a hard question. No, okay, and let's see. Yes, Rachel, you just hit it right on, right on the head, perfect. No one knows how they work because they don't care. <laughs> so before, the reason that people would get this digital expertise is because they wanted to use the computer and they had to have the know-how in order to use the computer. Well now, uh, to use an iPad, you don't need to have that. You can be quote unquote tech savvy by being able to use your smartphone, by being able to use your tablet. You know, you can raise your hand and fix the, the teacher's smart board issue maybe. Uh, but, but you still might not have any idea how a computer works or how to create content for a computer. And by that I mean how to make a website or how to program. So, uh, and that's where it, there's a difference between being quote unquote tech savvy, right? Being able to, to use your smartphone and being fully digitally literate. So you can be literate, you know, being able to read and write. And we like to think about digital literacy along that same, same lines, being able to read, um, quote unquote, is like being able to use devices, go on the internet, um, you know, use your phone. Being able to write, however, is, is the other end, you know, being able to create content 
for technology or with technology. So being able to program, uh, being able to make those web pages, uh, knowing how the inside of your computer works, being able to fix your computer. Okay? So that's why Raspberry Pi is so great. This is the one that we're working with here, the Raspberry Pi 2. Because it allows um, young people to, to get back uh, to the basics with technology, to understand what an operating system is, to understand how you know the different components of your computer, being able to put together a computer, uh, having something that you can do things like change the, the preferences and go into your terminal and make these changes. And it's, and you know, it's not the end of the world. You're not destroying your thousands of dollars worth of, of, of technology if you make a mistake. Um, right, because it's pretty, you know, relatively cheap $35 machine. And that SD card is even cheaper. Um, and you can just kind of toss your SD card and get a new one if some sort of catastrophe, uh, you know, occurs, which hopefully no catastrophes this semester. I am getting a request, a repeated request, before we move on to see the cat app that I referred to at the end of Monday's webinar. Here we are. They started to make more. But this is the one that my cat, the cat I was with, played with. So it's like little fish that fly, that swim by. Here it is. And then the cat tries to hit him. It works. It's funny. Here we go. Apps for cats. Who knew? Okay. So, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to watch this little intro to the Raspberry Pi. And what I want you to do, if you have your Raspberry Pi with you, if you are using your Raspberry Pi today, it's okay if you are not. But if you do and you have it with you, then while we watch this video, I want you to kind of hold your Pi and go through the components as they are described in the video. And there you have it. Your shiny new... <laughs> Oops. So you've got your first Raspberry Pi, you lucky thing. But now what? Well, fear not, adventurers. I'm here to explain all. The Raspberry Pi is a tiny computer that has the ability to do loads of wonderful things. So, oh, let's take a closer look. <laughs> you probably want to use a mouse or a keyboard. That's what these USB ports are for. Oh, wait. All right, so on your Raspberry Pi, try to find these ports. These should be really typical, something that you're used to seeing. Your laptop has one. If you have a laptop, your desktop has them. If you have a desktop, they're how keyboards and mice plug into your desktop. Unless you have Bluetooth or a wireless mouse or keyboard. That's where your flash drive goes, your USB uh, flash drive goes. also an HDMI port. Don't worry about plugging anything in right now. We're just finding the, the pieces. For a display, you can use a monitor or even your family TV. <laughs> and this is an Ethernet port, so you can connect to the internet. <laughs> your Raspberry Pi even has a connector for a special camera module. It can hook up to lots of other devices if you use a USB hub too. So now we've had a look around the Raspberry Pi, let's get set up. So now this strange little British man is going to walk us through the different 
pieces other than just the Raspberry Pi that we'll need and how, you know, they show that monitor, that HDMI cable going off into somewhere where we're going to see that where it goes to. First, you're going to need a screen. This can be connected with an HDMI or analog cable. So, uh, we're going to, yeah, need this HDMI connection. Depending on the kind of display you're using. Next, a USB mouse and keyboard. Micro USB power supply, like. Um, and you should have received this. What you'd use to charge your. Your cord is going to look like this, but with a USB slot right here. Mobile phone, and an Ethernet cable. To so your Pi should have, uh, uh, or may have come with the Bluetooth Wi-Fi setup. Um, in which case you wouldn't need to use an Ethernet, but this would plug in directly to where internet comes into your home which is to the web, the router. Get online. The operating system runs from a micro SD card. Make sure you can locate this. This is really important. This is the, the quote unquote hard drive of your Just machine. Just like the one in your digital camera. You can download your operating system for free on the Raspberry Pi website. If you want to get started. You don't have to worry about this step because um, this has been done for you, but this is uh, hopefully in the future you'd be able to kind of check this out and look at what's going on here because it's really neat the fact that you know you can boot up your Raspberry Pi uh, it still needs to have that SD card there but uh, it would just have kind of this line base Deep until you select you can buy a noobs card which comes preloaded with a choice of operating system um, until you select your operating system from this screen and you have to actually type in uh, terminal commands, which we'll take a look at later in the class. You have to actually type in start X, and it'll start your desktop. So for everyone, from beginners to experts. And there you have it. Your shiny new Raspberry Pi is ready for you to boot up or start doing fantastic things. So he's going to about to go through some examples, and I want to make sure you realize that um, he is being very truthful in these examples. So you're going to hear things like, put your Raspberry Pi on a rocket. Uh, he's not, you know, just being silly or using that as, as an example that you couldn't do. This is all real experiments that, that kids have done. Build an arcade machine. Real. Make a robot. Uh. Create music. Fly a drone. Or send your pie into space. So what are you waiting for? Who caught the name of that rocket? Anyone see the name of that rocket? It was a pretty cool dude. Father of computing. That was the Babbage rocket. Go on. Make your Raspberry Pi do something truly amazing. <laughs> All right. So making that arcade game, making a, uh, you know, putting your Raspberry Pi on a rocket to collect data or take pictures, that's not an um, easy thing to do, but it's something that you can do with your Pi. Uh, and, and it would take time and research and patience, and you'd probably run into errors every step along the way, but it's definitely very rewarding. Um, and, and it's that kind of uh, curiosity that the Raspberry Pi was designed for well, hey, I really want to make a robot, and I have the pieces now I can make a robot. How do I make a robot? How am I going to go about making this robot? All right, so what we're going to do now is go through putting together your Raspberry Pi. So what I want you to do is find your USB mouse and USB keyboard and plug them into your, uh, two of the four USB slots. All right. The next step after you've plugged in the USB um, keyboard and mouse, the, the slots, would be to plug in 
headphones. If you want to use headphones or if you want to use that. And that is not required. The next big step, and this one is probably going to take you longer than the, the mouse and the keyboard, is to plug in the HDMI cable between your monitor, and that could be a TV monitor, or that could be a, a, a regular computer monitor, and the Pi. Alright, so you have your mouse and keyboard plugged in, your monitor plugged in. Those are the two important things for right now. The next big one that we're going to do, and I know that not everyone is caught up right now, but I want to get most people caught up, and then we can kind of go back and see if we need more help. If someone needs more help, maybe they were stuck on the mouse step for a while and then missed the monitor step, that's okay. We'll go back and answer those questions. But for most of you who have your keyboard and mouse plugged in, your monitor plugged in, I want you to insert your SD card. I have a better picture of this here, of someone actually plugging their SD card in. It's, it's right... here on your Pi, so on the opposite end as the USB keyboard and mouse. And you plug it in so that you can't see the gold bars and it should click for you. It should kind of click when it's all the way pushed in. No, don't worry. If you already figured out how to set your, your, your Raspberry Pi up, you can just kind of hang out for a little bit right now. You can explore the desktop if you'd like to. Is the HTMI thing with the blue spinning things? I am not sure what you are referring to. The HT oh HDMI with the blue spinny things. Let me look and see what you could be talking about here. I am at a loss. This is where your HDMI cable plugs in. Laura, I'm not sure what the blue spinny things are. I'm sending a clarifying question for you there. Okay. Again, if you're having separate issues, individual issues, that's okay. I'm going to show the next step so that those of you who, who do have kind of everything working can start exploring the desktop and then we'll handle individual issues. So let's take a look. This is all set up, all plugged in, mouse and keyboard. Mouse and keyboard are plugged in. Audio is plugged in. HDMI is plugged in. SD card is plugged in. Then, before you add power, before you add power, you have to make sure that your monitor is turned on. So your monitor is going to have to be plugged into the wall, into some sort of power source. 
and turned on before you plug it into the Raspberry Pi. All right, so once you are sure, mouse, keyboard, HDMI, SD card, your monitor is plugged in and turned on, then you can add power by plugging this micro SD, uh, this micro USB cable in. And you'll notice that on one side you have this small connector, the micro USB. And on the other side is the regular USB. And this can be plugged into like an, um, a, a phone charger, a cell phone charger that has a spot um, for your phone cord. Or it can be plugged directly into your laptop. It's just really important to keep in mind that if you're using your laptop to power your Raspberry Pi, that's the only thing that it's doing. It's not transferring any sort of power or processing. All it's doing is powering your Pi, adding electricity. All right, and when it's all powered up, this desktop should come up, should pop up. So let me look and see if there are any individual issues. On the cord, Laura, I'm not sure um, if, if this is what the end of the cord looks like. That's how you know. Not the color, not the shape back here. This is what it looks like. It's kind of a rectangle and then this smaller rectangle below it. This piece here, that's how you can tell. Well, Laura, you plug it in right here in the HDMI spot. And it's HDMI. What about on the monitor? You have to look for the little piece of hardware that looks like that, Laura, because everyone it, it will look like this on the side. Um, and maybe a parent could help you. Um, since I'm not familiar with your monitor, it, it most likely is in the back. Um, this is what the port will look like. Unless your cable is like this, in which case uh, the port will look something like the like this. Honestly, um, it will fit in with all little holes on this side. If you don't have anything that looks like like this or like this, or you know, maybe it does look like this, but your cord only has two sides that look like this, you may need a different cord or a different monitor.
Um, well, Emma, that could be because the cord is not an HDMI to HDMI connection. You gotta make sure you have the right cord. Um, so if you take a look at, at this here, this cord here, see how it says HDMI to DVI lead? You know, the HDMI connector, there are a lot of HDMI cords that both sides of the cord look like HDMI. There are some cords where one side looks like HDMI, HDMI, and one side looks like DVI. There are a lot of different cords um, meant for very specific pieces of hardware. So you got to make sure you got the right cords. And so if you're not sure or you can't get it to work tonight, um, you can talk to Mr. Dubik or send me maybe a picture of the cord and a picture of your monitor uh, and I can try to help you and walk you through it. Um, but it's kind of the best we can do for right now. Okay, Emma, sorry you have the wrong one. Hopefully you can find an HDMI cord that works for Monday. Still definitely follow along with us, and you'll also have the recording to go back to. All right, it's 7.35, and so what I want to do right now is go through the desktop connection. If you have a question uh, sometime in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be moving through the desktop section and not stopping for questions until the end. If you have a question about anything, please still ask it. And when I finish the desktop introduction, we're going to go through troubleshooting and then we're going to go through the desktop. At that point, I'll check. I'll probably check between troubleshooting and the desktop as well, but still ask the questions. Just know it might take me a little bit of time to respond. All right. So once you add the power, right, you have your mouse and your keyboard connected, your um, monitor connected, your SD card is in, your monitor is on, then you add power into the system, and your Raspberry Pi should boot up. It won't automatically be this desktop. It will take some time to get here, but the desktop should come up. What happens if it doesn't? Do you freak out? No, you don't freak out. You go through a systematic process called troubleshooting. What troubleshooting is, is it's like a set of established steps that you go through to try to figure out what the problem is. And these steps are based off of the biggest problems that people run into, the most common problems. And since there are, you know, common problems, we go about having these checks to see. So the way that the Raspberry Pi does these checks are with the LED light. I want to know they should look something like this. It's a little bit of a different configuration because that's the first model. Um, but somewhere down here you should see the lights might be these guys. All right, and the lights tell you different information. Now, let's say you have your whole setup ready to go, and you, you plug in the power, and nothing happens on your monitor. You take a look at your Raspberry Pi, and you realize you don't see any lights, no LEDs are turned on. That means that there's a problem with your power source. No power is actually getting to the Raspberry Pi. So what you should do is check the power cords, check how this is connected into this slot, check to make sure that the cord is connected well into whatever is powering it, whether it be an outlet or a laptop, etc. Check, check the power line. All right, let's say that um, you, you, you try to power up your Raspberry Pi, nothing comes on the monitor, 
but there is a red light on your pie. What that is telling you is that, oh, oh no. So I guess tip something over on a little bit of tea over on my table. No worries. Okay. Um, if you have, whoops, just the red light, what that is telling you is that you do have power going to the Raspberry Pi, but uh, the it's acting as though there's no SD card. Something is not right with the SD card. So you want to go through and make sure that it is plugged in correctly. And by that, you, you don't see the gold bars. The gold bars face inwards. And then it's plugged in snugly. And I know that you guys, you probably have this smaller one here. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Should look like that. Do they have a better picture of the LEDs? No, they do not. Wait. Oh, man. All right. Um, but that's where you, you need to plug in, make sure your SD card fits snugly. Okay, so let's say you have your setup, everything is set up to go, um, but nothing is coming up on your monitor, but you have a red light and a green light on your Raspberry Pi. What that means is that your Raspberry Pi is now booted up um, and it does not sense that there is a monitor. So everything is fully working. You have um, the power to the, the Pi, and the green light is letting you know that, hey, your SD card is working, the whole computer is working, but we don't sense a monitor. <laughs> um, you know, the computer does not sense a monitor, so we're going to be working in monitor-free mode. And the reason that the Raspberry Pi has monitor-free mode uh, you know, before in that intro video that we saw, he talked about sending your Raspberry Pi up on a rocket. And that was, you know, he was actually talking about a real experiment. Because um, let's say, for example, you used that cool camera piece that he talked about, that little add-on where you could take pictures with your Pi. And you wanted to program your Pi so that it would take a picture every five seconds. And so you're going to program it to take a picture every five seconds and then put it on a rocket and send the rocket up so that you would get this collection of photos as your Raspberry Pi flew up into space and, you know, came back down. Well, you could program it, uh, you know, with your Raspberry Pi set up normally, just like this, uh, so that you do, you know, you have access to a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse. Um, and, and you program it just like you would normally, like how it is right now. And then you could find, um, uh, set the Raspberry Pi up so that you, you no longer have a mouse or keyboard connected. You no longer have a monitor connected. Um, and you just have some sort of external power source, like a battery, connected to the Pi so that it is going to take pictures um, or, or do whatever you programmed it to do. And so now, right now, it's operating more as something um, to take data, to experiment with, as opposed to a regular computer. So that's why the Raspberry Pi can work without a monitor. And so it thinks that's what it's doing when you see the red and green light. So with the red and green light, you need to check and make sure that the monitor is working correctly. Maybe something's wrong with your cord. Maybe everything's not plugged in correctly. Or maybe your monitor was not on when you turned the Raspberry Pi on. Because right when that Raspberry Pi turns on, it's going to check. It's going to see, hey, is the monitor plugged in? And if it's not, it's going to assume, all right, that's cool. Uh, we're operating in monitor-free mode. No worries. And it's not going to check again. 
So if you turn the Raspberry Pi on and then the monitor on, it's too late. You gotta start over. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Just unplug uh, your Raspberry Pi from the power source, turn that monitor on, and then plug uh, power back into the Raspberry Pi. All right, I'm briefly gonna check for questions. Laura, I think that there is no sound just on your end. I'm sorry. Not having that issue with anyone else. All right, then we're going to continue. So those are some good troubleshooting methods. So let's take a look at the desktop. You got everything up and working. What are these icons that we see? Well, the first one up here, don't pay attention to this misleading arrow, up here is the Pi Store. And the Pi Store has access to lots of cool stuff. You do need to have the internet for the Pi Store sure to work. But um, it should... You should be able to look at the, the different things that you can download um, for free, different kind of apps. It's like the App Store if you have um, any sort of Mac product. But, um, a lot of the, these are free. Some people were saying that they actually couldn't find the Pi Store on their desktop. That's okay. It's in your file manager somewhere, which is at the bottom of your screen down here. And we'll definitely get to that. Wolfram and Mathematica um, are two very cool uh, programs that actually work together. And we will take a look at these, but we're not going to take a look at them right now. Uh, same with the, the, the Debian reference. You can use that with your terminal. Okay, idle, now that is an important um, one that I do want to talk about briefly here. Idle uh, is the interactive development environment, I-D-L-E, uh, that you use when you want to code in Python. And Python is this powerful programming language that we will be using this semester for line-based coding. Um, and there's the Python shell there. All right, so if you look in your file manager, somewhere um, on this Pi, you should see the application that says Python. But we actually rarely, if ever, would click on that file that says Python. Um, and that's because that is something that might get launched if you're using a Python program that you wrote. Um, we will be using a Python program that we write to manipulate Minecraft on these devices. Okay. Normally, though, as when we're using Python, we're using it as developers, uh, you know, to write our programs. So that's why we're using the interactive development environment, Idle. You'll see that there is an Idle and an Idle three. We use the different versions of Python for different things. So we use Idle, the original, when we're hacking into Minecraft. All right, we're not going to talk about OCR resources right now. But it is pretty neat. The terminal, if you guys can remember that video we saw, uh, and I posted it on Edmodo, where... Um, it was kids react, there we go, kids react to old computers and the computer bo booted up and you could just kind of type lines of code. That's really similar to what terminal is now. It's how you can give dire direct commands to your computer. That's what people would use. That's what their computer was, quite honestly, um, before the desktop was added. Uh, people still use terminal all the time. Um, when you gotta change certain preferences, in your computer or check uh, you know what's going on with your computer to see if your computer is okay sometimes your computer might be acting strange so you can run a command in terminal to just um, check what's going on and 
we will be using terminal. We will be using some commands uh, this semester. Shut down. That should be pretty self-explanatory. That's how we can shut down our computers before we turn them off. Midori is a web browser like Safari or Google Chrome. Wi-Fi config. Uh, you can use this icon to get set up on your home's Wi-Fi network if you have a Wi-Fi network um, at your house then when you add the Bluetooth uh, wireless um, connection there uh, you can use this icon to connect. Sorry, I'm distracted by a question. Okay, someone said to get internet, you have to plug the Pi into the Wi-Fi router, correct? Well, so it's where it gets a little confusing. If you want to use Wi-Fi, uh, there, there is something that you can plug into your Raspberry Pi that will allow the Raspberry Pi to hook up to your Wi-Fi. If you want to connect to the internet through your router, then you could use an Ethernet cord. So those are two options that we'll get to. We're not going to worry about them today. And that can help you connect to your Wi-Fi. Python games is neat. Um, so Python is just line based. Uh, you can make games with Python and we do make games with Python. However, normally or, or these games in Python don't use graphics. So they're not like Pong or Space Invaders or kind of um, you know Flappy Bird or anything like that where they have those pictures that the user is manipulating. They would be text-based games, so a joke generator, or a number guessing game, where you see text as the user, um, the text is created with the program, and then the user can type a response, um, and that's how the game is played. Now, Python games actually combines graphics and Python, and that's pretty neat, um, and we may get around to using that this semester. For right now, if you open Python games, you can see um, that there are already some games for you that you can absolutely enjoy. I recommend Squirrel. It is a pretty fun game. And Scratch. And we'll be using Scratch definitely this semester starting Monday to make some games. All right. So I'm going to jump off of this lecture right now and see if we have any questions. No questions? No one has a question? Not even about hacking Minecraft? That was a big question in the last class. Is anyone having issues getting on their Raspberry Pi? Excellent. All right. In that case, we can move ahead. Let's keep going. Why not? So go ahead and open your terminal if you have your Raspberry Pi set up. And into your terminal, you're going to type sudo raspy config. If you are using a laptop or a desktop, you do not want to type sudo into your terminal. Oh, what's going on here? So you're going to type sudo raspy config and you really, the reason that you don't want to type sudo into um, the, the, a regular computer is it makes you, um, it gives extra quote unquote authority uh, to users. And so this means that you could actually, I'm using something like sudo or making yourself a root user of the computer, you could do a lot of damage to your computer. Damage that cannot be 
um, undone. So on the Raspberry Pi, uh, it's very forgiving and, um, you know, $35 as opposed to thousands of dollars. But you just want to be really careful. Know that the, the commands that you type into your Raspberry Pi, they do have meaning. And that makes you, um, it gives you certain security privileges. And Raspi config, you're configuring the, the uh, Raspbian operating system. All right, Pi at Raspberry Pi. Um, that's referring to your username. Everyone has the same username right now. Everyone has the same password right now. You'll see that change user password. We're not changing the user password right now. You absolutely uh, do not have permission to change your user password until you leave this class. Uh, and the reason for that is if you have something wrong with your Raspberry Pi, and let's say, um, you know, it's the end of March, so we've been doing a lot of programming, you have a lot of files saved in Scratch, and you changed the password and forgot the password, there's absolutely nothing we can do to recover those files we have to completely start you over, so you are not allowed to change your user password. But once you type sudo raspy config into terminal and hit enter, this should pop up and it's actually a little menu. Yes, uh, Kate, you can, but this um, you can work on existing scratch projects later on, but this doesn't connect to internet. Okay, um, so notice that you cannot use your mouse. Still, you're just using your keyboard. You do not want to expand your file system. What, what you want to do is go down to three. And you want to set it to desktop login as user pi at the graphical desktop. and you can hit OK. And that should already be the, the given there. Now, uh, this option here, internationalization options, remember that these Raspberry Pis were made in England. So this option should have again been changed for most of you, but if you're having some of these weird effects where you're trying to type in Python or you're trying to type in Midori, that web browser, and some of the words, especially your numbers, aren't coming out like you think they would, that is because the U in keyboards in the US and in the UK are not set up the same way. So if you, you know, use the down arrow to get to four uh, and then hit right to get to select and hit enter, you'll make it here and you want to do the down arrow twice to change your keyboard layout and then hit right to get the select option and hit enter. And then you do want just a, a generic 105 piece key keyboard. This is just a generic keyboard. And again, right, the right arrow allows you to hit this OK. And you do not want a UK keyboard. So hopefully this should be connected for you, but if you find this error, that's why I'm going to go ahead and record this for anyone to refer back to. If you realize something's a little funky about your keyboard, you want to make sure that your keyboard layout is not from the UK, that it is English US. Again, scroll using the up and down keys to get to the option that you want, English US, and then the right arrow key will allow you to hit OK. And that's fine. Default is fine. No compose key is all right.
and you do not want to use the control alt backspace to try and make the X server. Okay. So I did want to get that on there. That's probably the last thing that we're going to go over today. Not the most exciting, but uh, if someone is having keyboard issues now, they can refer back to that to make sure we figure it out. Also, uh, um, it is valuable to understand how to use terminal and to understand the sorts of things that you can do with terminal. And we're going to practice with that with finding files, listing files, running files like Minecraft. All right, it's 7.58. Does anyone have any questions? You guys are a quiet bunch this evening. No questions? All right, that is how we're going to end class today. But I can show you, and that's what I'm looking up right now on YouTube, but I paused my screen just for a moment. Some cool Raspberry Pi projects that other people have done. All right, let's look at, I'm looking at some good ones. Hi, I'm Rob Bishop from Raspberry Pi, and uh, I'm here to tell you about five cool projects you can make with a Raspberry Pi. And I want you to note, this is the original Raspberry Pi. You guys have the Model B, and there's even a more powerful one coming out really soon, the, the 2. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of projects here, uh, one of which is a project called Pi in the Sky uh, by a guy called uh, Dave Ackerman, and he actually connected a Raspberry Pi to a weather balloon and sent it up into the upper atmosphere and, uh, and took pictures on the way up. And it's really quite awesome to think that you know, a bit of hardware that you might have in your bedroom, uh, you know, creating little scratch games on, has actually been into near space. That's pretty awesome. Another project is a uh, remote control forklift truck, which actually just came through a few minutes ago. It was pretty cool. Uh, where they've got a, a webcam on a forklift that you can remote control. And it just shows how easy it is to make robot-like things uh, using Python and the Pi. As you can see here, this is a feed from the camera that's uh, mounted on the forklift truck. From here, you can press the buttons to control it and the forklift truck will move. Uh, it's a very simple robotics. It is eight, so if you need to, to jump off, that's okay. I just thought it would be fun. Uh, some inspiration here, because remember that the Raspberry Pi was designed um, to get people interested in, in building with, um, with Raspberry Pi, uh, so that people would, would question, uh, you know, what can I do with this? Um, it's not an easy thing to be able to do, but uh, if you're passionate about it, um, you can do the research and, and you can work on it, work through any issues that you run into and, and kind of come up with your own robots or... project just shows how easy rocket. it is to, to uh, make robotics happen with a large point. Another project which I really liked uh, came from BET, as uh, with the Cheltenham uh, Makerspace guys while I was there. And uh, they actually uh, controlled a quadricopter with a bunch of bananas, <laughs> which kind of seems a bit random, but was pretty cool. There's also another one by uh, Carry On Philbin, who... Uh... So they were using, um, I don't know if you could see that, but they had some, some uh, uh, cords going, some, some wires going to bananas, and were actually touching them to have the quadcopter move in different directions. Or the drone. Uh, produced a, uh, a box uh, with a Raspberry Pi that um, printed out, which is pretty cool. Um, very simple project. Uh, it just shows how cool it is to make just fun things, really, using your Raspberry Pi. Uh, it doesn't have to be complicated, it doesn't have to have a purpose. It can, uh, it can just be interesting. Agreed. And another one from uh, New York, uh, 
uh, where it was a dog treat dispenser that emailed you back a photo of the dog eating the treats. Here you can see the thing he built. Um, he's a CNC enthusiast, so he, he produced all this casing and, and mechanics for it and just shows how it, it's good to see engineering as a complete solution, you know, uh, both in terms of creating a case or something like a 3D printer or CNC tools, through to actually doing the, the Python programming which powers the, uh, the interactivity. It's a huge variety of projects from, you know, all over the world uh, by boys and girls just showing what you can go and do. And so hopefully some inspiration for the future. No, your TV remote will not be able to control the Pi. Uh, someone asked, is my TV remote going to be able to control my Pi because I'm using my TV as my monitor? You will be able to turn the monitor on and off with the TV remote, but the it will not be able to, to do anything else um, since the Raspberry Pi is really only using the screen and not any of the other internal components of the TV that your uh, remote is controlling. What about the sound? Um, the sound, the reason that we didn't get to sound today, and I can show you on this slide, except I exited out of the slide. Give me one moment. You have to be really specific with your Raspberry Pi on how you want sound played. Again, I think that, you know, you ask most of the high schoolers that are in my intro to computer science class, they wouldn't even be able to tell you uh, that sound is a kind of output that is directed to the speakers. You know, that's some common, some, some, they could have thought through that problem, but they don't ever sit to actually think about it. Another thing that the Raspberry Pi makes you do and makes you kind of think about. So it should work. Remember that the Raspberry Pi does not have speakers of its own. You actually have to have them hooked up. And then let me show you this prompt. This is through Pi Games, it's just an example. But it asks you, how do you want, what do you want the audio output to be? Um, and so, you know, if you have speakers um, on your laptop and you're listening to music on your laptop and maybe your sibling says, hey, I don't want to hear that, <laughs> can you put your headphones on? You don't have to tell your computer, hey, I just put headphones in. Can you direct the sound output into my headphones now? It does it automatically for you. But in the Pi, you actually have to designate the audio output. And it can try to detect it immediately um, with the auto. Um, or you have the option of headphones or HDMI. Um, so I know this is a lot of information for you. But HDMI can actually carry both visual and auditory information. So if it just depends on the way that your computer or your TV works. If your TV has the speaker built into it, that's, that's one case. But if you use a different remote to control the volume, then you do the actual TV so that it's running through some, kind of some external speakers. I do not think you'll be able to run the, the sound directly off the TV. A long answer to your question, Laura, but hopefully that <laughs> makes a little bit of sense. If, if you do have external speakers for your TV, the other thing is if, it, if they have the headphone jack, um, like regular desk speakers have, and they might not, depending on how fancy these speakers are, uh, you could plug them in that way. Okay, okay. A lot of information about sound, I know. All right, everybody, unless I have any more questions, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you guys for coming out tonight. I'm really getting looking forward to, to starting to create with our Raspberry Pis. Have a wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend, and I will see you on Monday.